All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Richmond, Virginia, on the other side of the country by Taylor, Taylor Lote. How are you doing, Taylor? I'm very well. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Taylor is a commercial real estate investor specializing in buying real estate with passive investors. He teaches his podcast listeners how to build wealth with real estate on the Passive Wealth Strategy Show. New episodes every weekday. And what we're going to talk about is literally that buying real estate with passive investors. So, um, Taylor, maybe you bottom line this for people who don't understand the idea of passive investors or and passive investment can you just kind of bottom line that for people sure absolutely so all real estate deals have a few things in common you have the deal and the money and as the deals get bigger the money becomes bigger so when you're buying commercial real estate you might not have all the capital that you need to acquire say a 10 or 20 million dollar property but you have all the capabilities and knowledge to deliver on the deal so an act, as an active real estate investor you can partner with past investors to acquire their property and split the return essentially and that's what we do Right. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, so what kind of investments are you doing today? I mean, you said you, you said you're kind of commercial real estate focused and, and today, obviously, you know, people see the commercial real estate market going up and down, you know, malls emptying out, offices emptying out. So well, are, are there still very, very good sectors in commercial real estate? Yeah, that's a great question. So personally, I invest in multifamily and right. self-storage real estate. Mm -hmm. So Multifamily, when you have five units or more, technically it becomes commercial, but the properties that we invest in are generally north of 100 units, typically more than 150. And then the self-storage properties are comparably sized in terms of a, uh, a dollar value mm -hmm. standpoint. So we're not investing in say retail or office that have the occupancy issues that your listeners mm -hmm. are you know, certainly aware of out there. I like things that are, you know, necessities. We do have a shortage of housing in most of the parts of the country. So I think that speaks to the supply and demand aspect of that. And then mm -hmm. on the self-storage side, you know, we love our stuff. We love our things. And self-storage yeah. is a business of transition. People use it on the way up when they're moving to a new place because they got a better job and they use it on the way down when they're downsizing because the economy is in rough times. So those are the two sectors that I like to invest in. Yeah. And uh, on, on the self storage one, I mean, yeah, we're, we're kind of, you know, accumulators by nature, pack rats or whatever. And so, I mean, all you got to do is drive around and you see storage facilities everywhere, new ones coming on online all the time. And also, if you think about it too, um, which you obviously have, in a in a more difficult economy, you're right. Sometimes people have to downsize. They got to move into apartments, whatever you know. And then once the first thing that they do is get a storage unit, uh, and so it's it, it kind of is it's a good investment in any market, really, isn't it? I agree, but I think in that sense we need to be careful about how we use that mindset. I think mm -hmm. when we start to think our asset class is invincible in bad markets, then mm -hmm. we start make poor decisions. So sure. we always have to be looking out for the potential downside. If you're looking for, say, a risk in real estate today that's more prominent than others, it's really the cost of debt. Interest rates have gone up so much, and that makes it a lot harder to do deals today. And there are a lot of folks who are in investments right now who had planned to refinance at rates that you know we were seeing back in 2021 and early in 2022. But those rates are long gone mm -hmm. and those folks who banked on being able to refinance at rates similar to that time are in a pretty tough spot today. So, you know, we need to, in my mind, my opinion, be careful about thinking we're uh, too cool for school, it's yeah. too cool for school, thinking we can't get in trouble. We need to be careful about that. No, absolutely, and obviously the uh, the multifamily market is is a, a big one right now again because I mean the the cost of home ownership of single family homes is and because of mortgage rates and whatever is 
is beyond a lot of people right now. But tell me, okay, if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be an investor, a passive investor in one of your deals, talk me through how that works. Sure. So I think on the passive investing front, the most important thing to do for an individual is to understand your investment goals. So think about what you want to get back out of your investments. Mm -hmm. And along with that, understand your risk tolerance, things along those lines, understand yourself before you start going, looking for, you know, any kind of investments. If you decide that I want to passively invest in real estate, you've already done your goal setting and you understand your own risk tolerance. You want to get into real estate. The next thing is to get educated on your chosen asset class, because there are a lot of asset classes out there. We've talked mm -hmm. about office, retail, multifamily, self-storage. Another one that's gotten very popular lately is triple net industrial. It's pretty popular. There are a lot of others out there, but you don't want to go in blindly because they're not all the same. And not everybody out there who's doing those types of deals has an equivalent level of experience. So get educated mm -hmm. on how the deals work, how they're working today, what a good deal looks like compared to a bad deal and start understanding how to differentiate red flags from the non red flags or how to look for warning signs that you might um, want to be concerned about. You know, education is so huge in this space because, you know, in any investment space, there are unfortunately unscrupulous people that try to take advantage of uneducated mm -hmm. investors that, you know, haven't put the work in. So I'd say, you know, listen to real estate investing podcasts, dig into how say multifamily deals work and what strategies are having success mm -hmm. today. And then look for operators that are executing on the business plan in the way that you are comfortable with and build relationships with them over time. Yeah. And maybe avoid the Instagram ads that tell you the passive income like of a million dollars overnight without doing anything. <laughs> if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It usually is, yeah. So tell me, uh, what what ex uh, what expectation? Because that's one of the things. What expectation of return do you, uh, do your investors have? I mean, is it a is it a longer term investment or there shorter terms? Um, what kind of return can you see? Sure. So my compliance guy will get mad if I talk about specific returns, okay. uh, but I'll say, you know, folks generally want to outperform what they could get in a bank account. They yep. want to look for cash flow that exceeds what they could make on a stock market investment because they are very illiquid investments. Yep. For the most part in this space, you're going to invest and you should probably plan on being in the deal for five to seven years, if not longer, that mm -hmm. expectation be, should be set up front. But you want to be comfortable with the dynamics of the deal, the cash flow that it produces, or if it's a development deal, you want to be, be comfortable with the back end pot potential because it's not going to produce cash flow if it's, if it's a development deal. So you know, generally, folks look for what you might call an illiquidity premium, essentially. They want right. to do better on cash flow terms than they could anywhere else and say publicly traded more more liquid securities but uh, i can't talk about specifics well, yeah. necessarily yeah you know that's fine um and and is this open to i mean are there are there investments like yours that are open to people at, at different ranges of investment i mean there is there is there a is there a, a floor to what you need to invest or can you find uh, a, an investment that you can make that you're not putting in that much money there are folks out there doing deals in this private real estate space that are accepting investment in like the thousand yeah, dollar range. Yeah. But, you know, in my space, we're we play much higher than that. Right. Generally speaking, we're 50,000 and up. We do some deals where, you know, our investors bring in a couple hundred thousand to north of a million. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an important term to discuss in this space when you're talking about uh, investors, and that's uh, accreditation. Basically, right. it's the metric of your either net worth or income, you have a million dollar net worth exceed, excluding the equity in your primary residence, or you make a certain amount of income every year, 200,000 for individuals mm -hmm. or 300,000 for married couples for the last two years, expecting to do that in the future, then you're accredited, right? And you can Google that and look at look up yep. accreditation. That qualifies investors to participate in a much broader range of investments but for non-accredited investors, uh, they're more limited. They have access to some of these syndication deals. And then there are other more, uh, what you might call crowdfunding deals out there, crowdfunding platforms that are taking smaller investments. 
personally, I'm I'm a little skeptical of those, you know, not to call anybody out. I'm certainly not going to do that. But but the folks that will take a, a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, you know, is it really worth it? If you have a really good deal, do you need to go and accept investment of a thousand and two thousand when there are plenty of folks out there that are willing to invest 50, 100, 250 and up, you know, do you really have a, a great deal in that case, if you're taking a thousand bucks, are you kind of, you know, I hate to say scraping the bottom of the barrel, but, but trying to go after people who might not have the experience and the track record to properly vet the deal, if that makes sense, maybe. Yeah, different. no, totally. I, and I think, I think it's what you said at the outset. I think it's educating yourself that if you only have a, you know, a, a small amount of money to invest, something like this may not be the best vehicle for your investment. Right. If you have more money, uh, obviously you have more, more options, but if you have more money, obviously this is something that's, that's more, more attractive, but it does, it does come down to, which is probably part of the reason why your podcast is successful. It comes down to educating yourself, as you said earlier, that's obvious. So when you, um, when you, when you educate or help people, what are some of the first things you tell them to do just to get themselves comfortable with, with even the direction they're going? Sure. So, I mean, I start by generally asking questions, you know, if I'm speaking with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, well, what's your investment experience? Again, what do you want to get back out of your investments? What's your time horizon look like? How do you feel about uh, giving up control over your investments? If you're not comfortable with that, then, you know, maybe you want to go do a deal on your own. And then you can have more nuanced and detailed conversations about specific tax advantages to real estate investing or versus, you know, lending, which mm -hmm. is treated as active income, but, you know, then you're in a debt position. It's very different. So really digging into, I think, folks goals and, and understanding what they want to get back out of their investments. And then you can generally point them in a direction of somewhere that they can get more educated. Uh, you know, I always harp on that, but I really do believe that that's the answer in a lot of cases, especially when you're new and just trying to find your way, understand your own goals, and then go out there and look for something that suits your goals and needs. Because say, if you're somebody who does not want to give up control in your investments, then being a passive investor doesn't make any sense because you want to maintain control over your deals. But on the other side of that, if you want to maintain control and you have money, then you're going to need to put the time in, put in the energy to go do your own real estate deals. And not everybody wants to do that. So knowing your goals, what you bring to the table, and really taking a holistic picture of those things and setting a course, I think really is what makes the most sense. Yeah, because at the at the end of the day, right, you're not you're not you're not just investing in a say a multifamily uh, building or whatever. You're investing in the expertise of the people who are running the investment and who, and and that's the that's probably as you said that that's really important because if you are to give up control, you need to be able to trust or at least you know feel comfortable that these are the right people, these are experts. So also that's probably one of the key pieces. Uh, is the comfort level with you as the as the running the investment i agree i think you know it, it's interesting so i think a lot of times when folks say get educated in real estate people are saying go out and get educated go learn they're really saying come buy my course come buy my mm -hmm. book well i don't have a course i don't sell education my podcast is free you know tune in it's i'm saying that because i genuinely believe that education can help us solve our goals. But going back to the, um, the the course aspect and really being comfortable with the people that we're investing with, I think when you you get educated on how these deals work at, at a you know true deep level, you start to be able to see who's the real deal and who is just really good at social media marketing. There are mm -hmm. actually differences to those. There are folks out there that have incredible, say, Instagram or TikTok followings or YouTube followings who, you know, have built a large following online, but haven't done all that much uh, in the way of the number of real estate deals that they do. But because of their very powerful brand, they've been able to raise money for deals. Now, certainly not everybody that has mm -hmm. a big real estate following. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying that as you get more educated, you can sniff out the folks who are, you know, um, what's what's the saying they uh, use in Texas? Uh, all hat and no cattle, I think, is the phrase, <laughs> right? You know, it's all branding. <laughs> not so much. It feels um, yeah. So it's really, again, getting educated, being able to see their track record, get references, talk to other passive investors, you know, really dig in because it's a big commitment when you invest in a deal passively. Like I said, you're signing up to be in business with somebody generally for five to seven years. It's kind of like a temporary marriage, if you will. Yeah. And you're committing, you know, your funds, your hard earned money to a deal. It's worth putting in the effort up front to really know what you're getting into. Yeah, no, 100%. And yeah, you don't want to be uh, investing with somebody who's making all their money off uh, YouTube advertising or TikTok ads and actually aren't doing that many deals. So tell me about from from when you from when you decide, okay, this is something I want to do. Uh, and uh, how long does it take to actually the investment, you know, to get it up and get up and running? I mean, how often do you have new investments available for people? So yeah, it depends. Um... I think a lot of folks who, let's say you want to get started, you feel you're educated enough and you want to get going. There are pretty consistent, you know, real estate deals happening all over the place. You could, you could Google, you know, tonight and find a deal to invest in, but just because you found it doesn't necessarily mean that you should commit capital mm -hmm. to it. So it's really that researching and understanding, reading the legal documents, seeking uh, an attorney's opinion if you're so inclined. And really doing that due diligence up front before you commit to a deal. And we all have our different levels of, of comfort, different mm -hmm. levels of education and experience that we bring to the table. I don't necessarily mean formal education, sure. but education in the real estate way, if you will. So for me, I'll give you an example, a company that I have passively invested with and was ultimately successful. I knew those folks for pretty well over a year and I had watched them do deals, a couple of deals mm -hmm. before I decided to invest. I said, okay, I'm going to watch them. I'm going to see how this deals deal goes. And then once I'm ready, I'll set capital aside when they have a deal, I'll invest the money. So I put in that work up front to realize, are these the folks or understand, are these the types of folks that I want to invest with? And when I finally decided, yes, I want to do business with these people, I will invest in their next offering. Now, I was going to look at it and evaluate it, but it was pretty much a yes, unless it became a no. So I set the capital aside. They had the their next deal. This was back in 2019. I invested in the deal and that deal recently exited within the last couple of months. We did pretty well on it, but the really the key there was that I didn't just immediately get into business with them. I took the time, the amount of time that I needed for me and my experience, my level of comfort to be ready to invest with them and we're all different in that mm -hmm. sense you know so i think in terms of the amount of time that it takes an individual is is very individualized sure you know? i know um, I, I love um, asking how long is a piece of string questions but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> how big is a pile of sand how many grains are in a pile of sand right yeah so, exactly yeah. exactly but but from but from what you've said is the, the key things that i've taken away from what you've been saying is number one is educate yourself obviously. Number two is understand that a passive investment means you're giving up, a, you're giving up control. Mm -hmm. So you need, and number three, you, you need to be comfortable with the people you're investing with. And, and maybe you have to have a little bit of patience as you discover who are the right people to go with and, and do your, do your due diligence. But I think that those for me uh, have come across as the key is educating yourself, uh, understanding that this is a different type of investment than, you know, just running your stock portfolio uh, and that you need to be trust and get, get comfortable with the people you're going to work with. Yeah, absolutely. There's this topic of counterparty risk, right? Well, mm -hmm. if you're buying a, you know, broad based index fund on a major, uh, major brokerage, well, you probably don't have a ton of counterparty risk. There. There's a ton of regulation place, sure. but if you're investing in any kind of you know, private deal, there's plenty of counterparty risk, right? We are all aware of Ponzi schemes that have sure. happened out there. We want to defend ourselves from those. And there are a lot of steps that we can take in terms of getting educated, taking our time, networking with others and asking questions, reading the legal documents that can really help us understand and defend our investment up front. That, that up front is when we do the work. It's on the back end. It's too late. 
right? So yeah, <laughs> work is all up front. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true because, uh, yeah, if you're doing a lot of work afterwards and if you're a lot of stress, it's not very passive, is it? Yeah, <laughs> it gets very, uh, it gets a little more active at that stage. Well, listen, Taylor, this has been fantastic. Uh, some great nuggets of wisdom here. All of Taylor's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. So my podcast is the Passive Wealth Strategy Show, new episodes every weekday talking about building wealth on Main Street through real estate investing. My company is NT Capital at ntcapitalgroup.com. And if anybody wants to set up a call with me, just go to investwithtaylor.com. Investwithtaylor.com. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks again, Taylor. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you.